Hi, everyone. Um, I decided to do a video lecture for Chapter 3. Um, seems um, some of us are confused by it, and understandably, uh, taxes is a very vast and complex subject, and they try to put it all into a chapter for you to just get an overview of it. Um, know that no one in the world ever in history um, was a master, meaning they knew every single tax law ever created. Um, I have a master's in taxes and I don't know every tax law. I'm familiar with stuff, but it is a very complex area. Now, fortunately, in chapter three, we just focus on individual taxes. So we're going to um, walk you through how to identify the major types of uh, taxes in our society. And some of them you may be familiar with. And then we're going to focus on the individual federal income tax, how we calculate it. Um, and actually, the presentation in your book is a little antiquated. It's actually changed a little bit um, because a new president came in. And whenever a new president comes in or a new, a new Congress, there's sometimes tax changes. But this was a major tax change in our forms and everything look different. Um, and I'll point out those differences. And then we're going to talk about preparing, how you prepare it, what forms do you use, a very general overview. And then help you start selecting um, good tax strategies for life situations. So the first, and this is very important, is planning your tax strategy. Now, for many of you, you might say, I'm going to hire an accountant to do that because they are the experts in taxes. And that might be a route you want to take. But if you want to do this on your own, some things you need to be able um, to progress with this is you need to know the current tax law and how those tax laws affect you. Now, many of us don't have time to read through the tax law. Um, I've been working with it for 30, 35 years now as I said, and I'm considered an expert in my field, but I still don't know everything about it. Maintain complete and appropriate tax records, most definitely. Something else we need to keep in mind as we're planning our tax strategy is we should make purchase and investment decisions that are legal, okay, that follow the tax law, but will help us reduce our tax liability. For instance, I'll give you an example. Um, when people buy and sell stock of corporation, so you're a personal investor, you may buy stock of Apple when it's at a low price. And maybe this tax year, you sell Apple for a gain, meaning you sell it for more than you originally bought it at. Well, that gain will be taxed. Say you have another stock, ABC Company, and you notice ABC Company, the stock value is going down and you want to sell it, but you're like, should I sell it this tax year or next tax year? Well, if you sell ABC stock, it's going to give you a loss. Now, one of the tax laws says you can offset gains from um, stock sales with losses from stock sales. So that would reduce the amount of gain. So that's just a quick example of when should I buy, when should I sell, and what's the best time so that I don't pay the most in taxes. Time elapsed from January 1 until mid-April represents the portion of the year people work to pay their taxes. What does that mean? Well, most of the time, all the money you make from around January 1 until mid-April is really you paying, that's all your tax money. Even though you pay it over the entire year out of your paycheck, if you take a look at the, maybe the end of the year, you go, how much did I pay in federal income tax and social security tax and Medicare tax for the year? If you add those three numbers up, I guarantee it's probably the amount of gross pay you made from around January 1 until April 
21st, April, mid-April. So your goal is paying your fair share, but taking advantage of the tax law of tax benefits where they may affect you. As I said, you can hire an expert to do this, but if you were trying it on your own, these are some of the strategies you wanna look at to meet that goal. Now, what kind of taxes are there in society? Well, there's taxes on purchases, and you may be familiar with it, sales tax, right? In Pennsylvania, we have a sales tax. It's 6% on non-essential um, items. So not everything is subject to sales tax when you purchase it. It is a consumer tax, meaning you as the consumer are paying it. There's also what we call excise taxes. And an excise tax could be state or federal. Sales tax is usually just state. So each state has their own sales tax rules. Excise could be federal or state. They're usually, we call it the sin tax because they're usually, that tax is on the sinful items of society, gasoline, alcohol, tobacco, okay? And so it's just a different type of tax because it's on those types of items. There's taxes on property. So if you own real estate, you may pay uh, real estate taxes um, to your county, to your municipality, and to your school district. These taxes are based on the value of the property that you own. Personal property taxes, we don't have in Pennsylvania, but they are in other states and locales. Personal property tax is a tax on the value of something other than real estate you own. For instance, um, my stepson lives in South Carolina and he lived in North Carolina, and both of them have personal property tax. So when he goes and registers his vehicle for you know, each year, he pays a flat registration fee, pretty much like we do in Pennsylvania. But then he also pays a personal property tax on the value of his vehicle, which he bought a Dodge Charger, I think it was, and it was a very expensive vehicle. And he was a little surprised by the uh, amount of tax that he had to pay on it. As I said, um, we don't have it in Pennsylvania, but it is a tax on property other than real estate. Taxes on wealth. The two main types of taxes on wealth are federal estate tax and state inheritance tax. Now, what's the difference? When somebody passes away, their property is considered their estate. And the federal government will tax the value of the person's property at the time of death. And the money to pay the taxes comes out of that um, group of assets they own. So, and I can tell you this, it's normally, so if I die, okay, my estate is not even a million dollars, okay? Right now, if your estate, the value of the property you own at death is less than I think $12 million, I think that's the number you're exempt, meaning you don't pay any federal estate tax. So it's really meant for um, wealthier individuals. Now states normally have an inheritance tax. Some may have a federal, or I'm sorry, an estate tax. An inheritance tax is a tax on the individual who receives the property from the deceased person. So in Pennsylvania, we have a state inheritance tax, meaning if someone passes away and you receive the property, you are responsible for paying a tax on that property. So if somebody leaves you their savings account, um, and it's only certain assets, it's not all, um, but if you receive anything of value from someone at death, you may be responsible for paying this tax. And it's not a high tax. And the closer you are in relation to that person, the lower the tax. Taxes on earnings are a final, income tax and social security. Now, there could be all different kind of income tax. We call it income tax because it's a tax 
on income you receive, whether you're working a job, you sell stock at a gain, you have interest on your savings account. There's all different ways to get income that could be taxed. So that tax is on the income. Sorry about that. I'm at my campground and someone's barking and yelling at their dog. Okay, <laughs> if you could hear that. Um, Social Security is a tax imposed on income when you're earning it. And it's used to fund Social Security for retirement and also Medicare. So again, if you are earning income, earning, so you're working, you own your own business or you're at a job, you normally are required to have this tax withheld and it's a federal tax to pay for Social Security and Medicare tax. Okay, so those are just the different types of taxes. Now, we're gonna focus on federal income tax for the rest of this discussion. And federal income tax of an individual is very complex. Uh, you know, there's a whole course I teach on this um, in the fall of each semester, uh, fall of semester of each year. So if you're interested in learning more specific laws, I encourage you, as long as you have accounting 112 done, you can take the course. Accounting majors have to take the course. Okay, so the first step in determining federal income tax is we calculate what's called adjusted gross income. And you, in accounting, we love acronyms, so we call that AGI, adjusted gross income. And that's a very important number on a tax return because it's used to calculate other items. So this process starts with steps to determine taxable income, which is the final number we use to determine tax. So what's included in adjusted gross income? All different kinds of income items. Not all income items, certain ones are excluded but earned income definitely. So if you work at a job or if you have your own business, the earnings will be taxed. And what is the earnings? Your gross amount if you work at a job and your net profit if you own your own business. Investment. Investments, as I was talking about in my example before, if you have a stock that you sell and you sell for a gain more than you originally bought it, that'll be taxed, that difference. Interest income, dividend income, rental income, net rental income. So if you have a rental property, once you subtract all the amounts you pay for that rental, that could be taxed. And something called passive income. And these are, a rental income is considered passive, but um, these are activities where you don't do anything and, it, and it's like a business, you own, it's like you're the silent partner in a business, okay? So you might be a partner in a partnership and don't do any activities in that partnership. Then you have, anytime that company makes income or loss, it's considered what we call passive. So these different types of income have different sets of rules related to them. There sometimes is an exclusion. So this is an amount not included in gross income. They give an example tax exempt income is not subject to tax. What are they? What if, um, when, I'll give you some examples. You're the beneficiary on a life insurance policy, not taxable to you. You win a lawsuit, the punitive damages. So those are the, or the winnings you get from a lawsuit that bring you back to being a whole person, not taxable. I'm sorry, not punitive. I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Compensatory, compensatory damages. Compensatory damages, not taxable. Um, we have tax-free interest. Sometimes there's tax-exempt interest you receive, not subject to tax. Okay, so there's many different items. Um, as I said, I have uh, two chapters on that in, the, in the, my fall semester. Just want to give you an overview. There's sometimes what we call tax-deferred income. And tax deferred income is, it's income, but you don't pay taxes on it now, you pay taxes on it later. Example, 
if you have a retirement plan at work, we refer in the most common type of retirement plan is what's called a 401k. And it's called that because that's the code section in the tax law <laughs> that explains the tax ramifications to this type of retirement plan. So a 401k, basically the employee sets aside money out of each paycheck that's invested um, by a, an investment company and that grows and when the employee retires, they have that income. Well, as the employee is setting the money aside, that part of their earnings for that time period are, is not taxed. So actually when an employee earns $1,000 a week, they have 10% of it set aside for retirement. What part of their gross pay of that thousand is actually taxed? $900. 1,000 is the gross, but 100 of it, 10% is put away. That's not taxed now. So the actual gross pay that is taxed right now is $900. Then later when the employee retires and they start collecting that money, that's when they'll pay income tax on it. So just some examples of that. Now, once we look and find the things that are included in our income, the next thing we do are subtract things that are allowed to be not included or subtracted out. Some examples, contributions to what we call traditional individual retirement account or IRA. So at certain times, um, you know, a person can contribute, it's up to $6,000 a year. 6,500, no, 6,000 this year. So in 2020, you contribute $6,000 to an individual retirement account that you opened up on your own. You may be able to deduct from your income that $6,000. Now, this isn't necessarily true now, but certain, if your divorce was before 2019, you and you pay alimony, you can deduct those as well. So those items can be deducted. So you take all the income that is included to be taxed, subtract the income, the items that are excluded or allowed to be subtracted, and you get adjusted gross income. So I'm just going to um, stop sharing this for a minute. Let me just end my show. I should have done this already, but um, go to the IRS's website. I'm gonna get an old tax return and show you where we're at. What the heck? Because I, me talking about it is great, but if you need to see this. Tax form changed in 2019. And so the explanation given here is for 2018 and before, nope, it actually changed in 2018, I lied. <laughs> okay, let me try another, 2017's time's running. Okay, so let me share this. Okay, so you should see a 1040, which is the income tax return that is usually filed by individuals. And you're gonna see there's a lot more on here than what we just talked about. But just to give you a glimpse, if you've never seen a tax form, is in lines up in the top, we give some administrative information. We have to select the filing status, and that's based on rules. We have to talk about if we have any type of dependents. Again, that's based on rules. You're not gonna learn all of those. Um, but here's your various income items. And here's some of the things we talked about, wages, interest, ordinary uh, dividends, alimony received is another, um, gains, capital gains, those are your gains on your sales of stock, rentals, if you get any money from a pension, that's taxable, um, even unemployment compensation. 
Okay, so we figure out all the items that of that we received in income this year that would be taxable and we would add them up to line 22. Then we figure out the things that we can deduct. For instance, um, right here, here's that IRA deduction that they mentioned in our slide. Here is the alimony deduction. But if you weren't aware, and we'll talk about it later, I believe, you can deduct student loan interest if you qualify. Okay, so there's various items that can be deducted. And then we get to that adjusted gross income. Now, if you're saying, oh wait, you're showing me 2017, it's different now. It is kind of, the form looks different. So let me take it back and show you the current 1040. And it's a little different. There's 2019. What did they do? Well, if you remember when they were doing the tax law change, if you were familiar with that time period, a big thing was, we're gonna make your tax return like a postcard. And they actually did. But in, what they did was, if you remember what that form I just showed you was a big long form, they took and put the main items that most everybody would have onto one page and took all those other items and put them on all different kinds of pages. So instead of having a two page tax return, people may have a five or six page tax return. So it gets kind of crazy, but you can see here, there's our wages, our tax exempt interests. Um, and then it comes up and it says, this is your total income, 7B. Then the next thing is you subtract those items that we had, let me show you 2017 really. Find any of these webs, um, any of these forms on um, the IRS's website. Go there, let me go prior. No, nope, that's not what I want. Two thousand seventeen. So all of these lines are still on the tax return. They're just not all together like they once were. Okay, but line eight A is really all the items I showed you down here. Okay, what they did was here's our two thousand nineteen tax return. I know this is confusing. Welcome to taxes. But instead of showing us everything on one tax form now they actually listed it in, whoops, what we call schedules. So when you do your 1040 now, some of those lines that were all in here on our 2017 are not longer on the 1040 form itself, they're separated out here. So that line 8A was really everything here. I know it's confusing, but just wanted to give you a glimpse at it. I'm going to go back to our PowerPoint. Okay, so now the next thing after we do our adjusted gross income is we compute the ultimate income that's tax, and so that would be computing taxable income. And this is an amount, a tax deduction, I'm sorry. There are tax deductions we can subtract from adjusted gross income to, re, to arrive at taxable income. So all of your income, even if it's included on the tax return, is never all tax because you still get what's called a standard deduction or itemized deduction. Now a standard deduction is based on, it's a set amount set by the government that is allowed to be deducted um, based on your filing status. So you could be a single person, you could be married filing a joint return, or you could be the, uh, a single person who has children or dependents, we call them. So you qualify for this head of household status. So you would take a look and go, okay, what's my standard deduction based on that? $6,000, let's say. Okay, now let's compare it to these personal expenses 
that I pay that are allowed to be added up and called itemized deductions. So medical and dental expenses you pay, they may be deductible, certain taxes, certain interests, certain contributions. If um, moving expenses are no longer deductible, okay, either are casualty and theft losses, unless you're in a disaster area. So there's two things that were in this slide from 2017 that are no longer allowed. And job-related expenses, they're not allowed as a deduction anymore. Okay, so we did have a big overhaul since this PowerPoint presentation and your book has been published. But these were the common ones during 2017. So back in 2017, you would have added these up and said, okay, how much do I have in all of these items? I have $7,000. Okay, according to my filing status, what's my standard deduction? $6,000. Okay, I could deduct either $6,000 or $7,000. It's a no-brainer, guys. You would, de you would use your itemized deductions. Well, let's say you went through this process and your itemized deductions were only $3,000. Well, you still get to take the standard deduction then. So it's really a comparison of the two, take the higher of the two amount. Right now, the standard deduction, if you're single, is $12,200, I think. If you're married filing joint, it's like $24,800. Okay, they vastly increased it from 2017. Now, this is a great, and I know this is in your book. So there is gross income. Look at wages, profits from your business, um, commissions that you may receive, even employee awards, interest income, gains or losses on the sale of stocks or bonds, alimony received, maybe taxable, maybe. If your divorce was finalized after 2019, it is not, or after 2018, it is not. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, 2018. Royalties, unemployment compensation is taxable, FYI. It is for federal purposes. Dividends, rental properties you own, the net profits from it, pensions you receive. Tips are taxable, by the way. <laughs> and bonuses, and even prizes, and gambling winnings. Yes, you don't say to yourself, oh, I went to the casino and I won five grand, but I lost six, so I don't have to report anything. No, you report 5,000. And then as an itemized deduction, you can deduct 5,000. So if you can't itemize because you don't have enough in those expenses from that prior slide, you include that gambling and you just have to pay the tax on it. The next thing down was those adjustments or deductions to get to adjusted gross income. Remember those were the IRA contributions if you paid alimony. Then you calculate your standard deduction and your itemized deductions. Now you notice something else there, it says exemptions. Back in 2017, this was the last year we were able to deduct something called an exemption. And we'll be talking about it. We don't have this anymore. Um, but an exemption is a set dollar amount and you multiply it by the number of dependents you have. So if you have kids, they're probably your dependent. If you have two dependents and plus you count yourself and your spouse, you would take four times, I think it was $4,000. And you also got to deduct that. We don't have that anymore. They eliminated that. But once we deduct those items, then we get it to taxable income. And this from there, we compute taxes. I know a lot of people have um, issues with that. Take tax credits, if we have those. They're a dollar for dollar reduction of our tax liability. Pay other taxes we may have to and then determine overall, after adding and subtracting all those tax components in step three, do we still owe money or did we pay too much in and should we get some money back? So we took a look at this already, tax forms and um, that should be filing information. So all your current tax forms and instruction booklets are online. We don't go to the post office anymore and pick them up. The, you could use reference books on current tax laws. Um, you need to have a social security number for, or an identification number for every member of your household if you're going to put them on your tax return. Now, the only people who could file a tax return as one tax return 
are married individuals. So even though your child may be your dependent, if they work and they have income, or if they just have income that should cause them to file a tax return, they file their own tax return. Okay, so I know a lot of people get confused by that. So if you're married, you can choose too. You don't have to file a joint tax return, we call that, with your spouse, but you can never put more than your spouse, spouse's information on a tax return. And you should keep copies of federal tax returns from previous years. The general rule is three years, but if you own a business, six. Now, what kind of records may you get? Well, the first one is the most common one people get. It's the W-2 form. And that's where your employer reports back to you how much salary or wages you made, so how much you should include on your tax return, and the federal income tax and other taxes that have been withheld from your paycheck throughout the year. A W-2P will report if you receive pension income. There's various, what we call 1099 forms that you may receive. One is a 1099 INT. That's where if you received interest that needs to be included or excluded on your tax return, you'll have that reported to you. Dividends you may receive. Remember dividends are when a corporation pays a shareholder profits back. And then capital gains and losses, which is the term we use to describe um, when we sell an investment at a gain more than we originally bought it or less. We use the word capital. It's in the tax law, it's defined as what we call a capital asset. And then there's 1099 forms for self-employment income. So that's a 1099 MI miscellaneous, they call that. So if you own your own business, you may receive this form from somebody if you do work for them, royalty income, and lump sum payments from your pension or retirement plan. So these are the various types of forms that an individual will receive, and also the government receives a copy, and that's they match that up on the tax return to make sure everything is being reported properly. You should keep track of all your expenses. Anytime you deduct something on your tax return, make sure you have um, adequate record keeping. For, so if you deduct anything from medical or you'll see you may be able to use dependent care. So if you put your child in child care, you make a charitable deduction. If you deduct mortgage interest, any type of business expense you deduct on a tax return because you own your own business or investment or rental property expense, keep it. You gotta be able to prove any amount you deduct on that tax return. Now, as I said before, we don't have this anymore. But in 2017, when all this stuff was made, we still had what was called an exemption deduction. So we would be able to deduct $4,050 per person for yourself, if you had a spouse on your tax return and any other dependents, usually children that you have, you would take the number of total dependents, you, your spouse and your children, multiply it by 4,050. And even after deducting the standard or itemized deduction, deduct the exemption amount and that would get you your taxable income. Now, once we have our taxable income, this is what we use to determine our tax liability. Now, we use tax tables, as you know, as you probably saw in the chapter. And we have in, in our federal income tax system, a progressive system, meaning as your income rises, so does your tax rate. But you'll see there's income in ranges. Everybody pays 10% on the first, whatever, 13,000, I think it is for head of household. Everybody, if they're in the head of household filing status. But as their income rises, then more of their income will be taxed at higher rates. The last tax rate used, or what we say, what your next dollar of taxable income would be taxed at, what rate, is called your marginal rate. And somebody will say, I'm in the 15% tax bracket. That's their marginal rate, meaning that is the last or next dollar would be taxed at. So after deductions and exemptions, a person in the 35% tax bracket 
would pay 35 cents in taxes for every extra dollar of taxable income they make in that bracket. So here is that table. So here's your tax rates. So if you're single, every single person claims a single filing status, they will take 10% times $9,325. So the first 9325 dollars is taxed at 10%. Then income in the range 9326 to 37950, if their taxable income is above 37950, that part of their income is taxed at 15%. So now you've taxed $37,950. We keep doing this in progression until we reach the bracket their taxable income lies in. So if their taxable income is 40 grand, then the final, their marginal tax rate is 25%. How much do we tax? 40,000 times 30, or I'm sorry, 40,000 minus 37,950 times 25% will be their final tax calculation because that's where their taxable income lies in that range of 25%. You approach, and you gotta be careful, you gotta make sure what filing status is the individuals or individual in, and then calculate their tax based on that table. Now, people will say, oh, okay, so my marginal tax bracket is 35%, but how much taxes do I really pay on average? So the way we determine that is we take the total tax paid divided, by, or total tax liability divided by taxable income. So the average tax rate is 16.5% for this person in this example, even though their tax bracket may be 80, you know, or 35, 35%, let's say, let's see, their taxable income is 50. I'm not sure what their filing status is, but let's say, I'm just gonna go back to the prior side. Let's say their tax bracket was 25%. Their last dollar of income is being taxed at 25%. But since they pay 10%, then 15%, then 25%, on average, every dollar, they're only paying 16 and a half cents. Okay, so again, how do we figure this out? Well, here's the tax on a married taxpayer's income of 95,000. So the tax table says the first zero to 18,650 of taxable income is taxed at 10%. So the total tax would be 1865. Their taxable income is 95,000. We've only taxed 18,650 so far. So now we need to tax the next um, amount be between would be 18,651 to 75,900 or 57,249 dollars. Multiply that by 15 percent. Now we've taxed and they would get 8587. So that portion of their taxable income is taxed at 15 percent. So how much income of the 95,000 have we taxed? 75,900. And I would probably argue that this should really be 57,250. Because if you add these two together, it is not 57,900. You're going to be off a few cents, but 57,250 should be the amount here. Then the 25%, this should really be 75,900. Holy moly, what happened here? That's the range. That should be 153, 100. So taxable income in this range is taxed at 25%, but their taxable income isn't anywhere near 153, 100. So of the 70, of the 95,000, they've already paid income tax on 75,900. So the difference there, which I would make 19,100 times 25% is how much income tax is on 75,900 to 95,000. Then add those three up, and that's your total tax. Your average tax rate would be that total divided by 
taxable income of 95,000, 16%. Marginal tax rate is 25% because the next dollar of income, taxable income, would be taxed at 25%. So hopefully that makes that much clearer. Yeah, I'm not too keen on how they're doing this calculation in here, because if you add these up, they do not equal 95,000. So according to their calculation, they did Egypt the government out of tax on $2. <laughs> so you gotta be careful of that. Alternative minimum tax, I don't even know why they bring it up, but it's um, usually assessed on high income individuals because usually people and the wealthier individuals can take advantage of some of the tax law. They have the ability to, so that they pay lower amounts of taxes and this forces them to pay more taxes, that's all. Now, once we create tax liability, we still aren't done. We just said, here's how much overall we owe in taxes. So there's certain instances where we pay for stuff that qualifies for a tax credit. What does that mean? It's a dollar for dollar reduction against your tax liability. What we did in the prior slides was if you saw a deduction, that reduced taxable income not tax, but taxable income to determine tax. These reduce tax. So earned income credit is an example of one. Child and depending care credits, um, a savers credit, and one of those that people could really take advantage of if they're in college, education credits. So these credits allow an individual to say, hey, I paid $2,000 for my tuition this year. And if you meet certain, certain rules, you can actually reduce your tax liability by $2,000. Not your income to calculate the tax, but the tax liability itself. Another way to reduce your tax liability is making tax payments, which you do if you, if you work because your employer is required by law to take a certain amount of, you know, take money out of your paycheck to cover your tax liability. Also, if you own your own business, an employer isn't taking money out of your paycheck. So you are responsible for making payments directly to the government. We call them estimated quarterly payments. But you should be making some type of payment to cover that tax liability. Now, once you subtract your tax payments and your tax credits from your tax liability, you're either gonna go, I pay, um, it's either gonna be positive or negative. If it's still positive, that means you still owe more money. You didn't pay enough in. If, you, if it's negative, the government owes you a refund. Now, you have to file your tax return by April 15th of each year. You can extend it though automatically for six months if you don't have all the information to complete your tax return. And sometimes that happens for whatever reason. Extending the tax return to file does not extend your tax return to pay. So you should pay all your taxes in by April 15th. If not, everybody would extend their tax return that owed money, right? So if you don't pay your money um, by April 15th, you can be penalized, pay, have to pay penalties and interest. If you are committing fraud, you could get in a real lot of trouble, okay? so. You wanna make sure that you're reporting all your income and you're paying your taxes by April 15th. Now, as I said, every citizen or resident of the United States and every US citizen who is a resident of Puerto Rico is required to file an income tax return if his or her income is above a certain amount and that's based on their filing status. So if you live in the United States, you are to file a tax return, even if you're not a citizen. If you're a citizen living in another country, you're still required to file a tax return. Okay, so keep that in mind. And if you live in Puerto Rico, you are also, because we, they're considered a um, territory. Your filing statuses you have to choose from, and these are, you choose them by rules, single, married filing joint, married filing separate, head of household, and that's usually somebody who isn't married um, and has a child as a dependent, and what we call qualifying widow or widower, 
with a dependent. So if your spouse passes away for two years after the year of death, if you have a dependent child who lives with you, you can file this status. But after those two years, then you have to choose another status. Most people are either married, filing joint, head of household, or single. So I'll give you an example. When I was a married, no children, I was single. When I got married, no children, married, filing joint, with children, married, filing joint. I got divorced. This is a true story, okay? When I got divorced, I had a child who lived with me, okay, and I was responsible for. Her. And I made sure in my divorce agreement that I got, I got to claim him as a dependent on my tax return. Um, then I was head of household. I remarried. Now I'm back to married filing joint. So there's approximately 800 federal tax forms and schedules. You will not fill them all out. I don't think I filled out every single one of them out, but there are some common ones. Now, pre-2018, we had a 1040, a 1040EZ, and a 1040A. The only form we use now is a 1040. Again, we looked at the 1040, and I'm gonna take you back there in a few minutes to show you the second page. But basically, the first section is your filing status and exemptions, then income, then any adjustments to income, those deductions to get to AGI, adjusted gross income, then you subtracted the higher of your standard deduction or itemized deduction and your exemptions to taxable income. Then you calculated your income tax, subtracted tax credits, but there may be other taxes you may need to add. You subtract your payments, and then it would determine if you have a refund or you owe. And we talked about that. And the most common filing error is a signature when we file paper returns. Okay, before we go on, I said you may have to pay additional taxes. And if, for instance, here's an example you own your own business, you're a sole proprietor. As a sole proprietor, you do not pay yourself a paycheck in the sense you would an employee. So you're not creating a paycheck for yourself and withholding federal income tax and social security tax you should be paying in your federal income tax under those quarterly payments we talked about. You should also be paying in towards Social Security using those quarterly payments. So a self-employed individual doesn't get away with not paying Social Security tax. They just pay it differently. They add it to their federal income tax return. Again, this is a lot of information I know, but just so you can understand, there may be other taxes. They're not common, but that's one common one. So that's the federal income tax. We're gonna come back to it in a few minutes, but there's a lot of state, or states also have income taxes. Um, there's all but seven. Let's see if I can name them. Alaska, Texas, Arizona, Delaware. Mm -hmm. I think Hawaii. Mm -mm. Did I say Nevada? I don't know. Um, and I think Wyoming. Okay, but I don't remember all of them, and I might be wrong, but there are a lot of states that don't have, seven of them at least, that don't have a state income tax. Because why? Because they don't need to. Oh, Florida too, the biggest one. Because people, they are able to get revenue from other sources like Texas, oil, Florida. They tax property there because the majority of the population is retired. They're, they're not working. So they find other taxes to impose. And depending on where you live, every state has their own tax laws. Pennsylvania, where what's called a, purport, um, a proportional tax, where we just tax certain amount, certain income items, 3.1%, we're done. But we also have a sales tax. Some states are higher, but don't have sales tax. Some states don't have a uh, income tax, but they have a huge sales tax. It all depends on where you live. How do I file my taxes online? Well, most people, and it's incredible because I remember back in the late 1990s, early 2000s, the IRS had a very aggressive strategy. They wanted everyone to file their tax return electronically by 2008. It's 2020 now, and um, only, uh, we're at 90%, a lot. And I think a lot of people do it because they get their refunds quicker but um, we are becoming much more efficient. So most people um, 
are filing taxes online. And it does cost a fee sometimes, and sometimes it doesn't. There is Free File Alliance. It's an online tax preparation and, and filing free to many taxpayers, but it's based on income. So if you're a high income taxpayer, you're not gonna be able to do that. Um, they also have Free File on the IRS's website. So you could take a look at that. Many companies have online software, like I use TurboTax. Okay, um, H&R Block at Home um, is another uh, filing service for for any individual to complete their turbo or to complete their tax return. And I forget who it was. I think it was Riley. I saw that you posted. Yeah, yeah I, I use TurboTax, and it, there's just so many questions and so many. And to to a tax preparer like myself, I'm like skip, 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 skip. Okay, but if you're if you're not familiar with tax, you want to go through and answer all those questions to properly complete the tax return. So it could take a while. Um, and you will complete online and print and mail or file online. Some considerations you want to take a look at are personal situations, any kind of special tax situations. Features in the software, there's audit check. Some softwares help you to future plan. So you, you can do some planning strategies because um, you pay for that service. And they'll even file your state return. And of course, you have to watch for your own limitations on your computer for hardware and operating systems. And then what kind of support do these companies provide you? There are tax assistance services from the IRS. I, feel, I hope you like classical music, though, if you call them, because um, that's what you listen to. <laughs> okay, but you can walk into a service at an IRS's office locally in Wilkesbury. There's an office. It's on um, the Wilkesbury Boulevard, and in Scranton there is an office as well. And there's other areas, as you can see there. You can go right to the IRS's website. Um, there's interactive tax assistance. If you use a software, they should have assistance. They even have an app. There's tax publications. Um, you can go to a, a large accounting firms a lot of times will post stuff on their websites. The key is just don't use, you know, Joe Smith's rules for creating your tax return. Make sure that it's a reliable source that you're using. Some other tax return prep services, H&R Block. Enrolled agents are... Um, People who proven they know the tax law through a, a government imposed test, they take a test by the IRS. And so they receive this status. They're not considered accountants, but they are considered um, experts for tax preparation. Um, of course, a CPA tax accountant and attorneys also are qualified. I saw somebody else and maybe that was you, Riley. You're like, I'm getting somebody else to do my taxes, <laughs> which is which is fine too. But if you're doing it yourself, some things to consider though when you are selecting a tax service, training and experience of the tax professional, the fees, how much are they going to charge you? Um, questionable stances they're taking on your tax return, like, oh yeah, we could, we could get away with deducting that. You want to second guess that because in the end, you're responsible for it. If your return is audited, will the person who prepared your tax return be able to represent you? Explain everything they did on the tax return. Not everybody is allowed to practice in front of the IRS. For instance, a CPA, an enrolled agent, an attorney, and you know, H&R Block, they can. But if you go to Joe Smith down the street who's been doing taxes for five years, he may not be able to represent you and explain your tax return to the IRS agent. So you can find out more information on these websites. Ultimately, you are responsible for providing complete and accurate information. Now, a lot of people get freaked out. They're like, oh my God, I'm going to go to jail if I forgot something. No, they're not like that. Um, a lot of times audits are very simple, mail things that you're like, they're like, hey, we think you missed this on your tax return. Oh my gosh, I did. And they'll just say, send us the money. Okay. Beware of tax preparers that offer refunds in advance. Refund anticipation loans can charge excessive interest rates. So only do this if it is extremely necessary. 
and know that hiring a tax preparer does not guarantee that you will pay the correct amount. What if your tax return is audited? A tax audit is a detailed examination of your return. In most audits, the IRS requests additional information to support your return. So you wanna make sure you keep all, everything, everything to support your return. Who gets audited? About 1% of all returns are audited. Now, I already mentioned the first type of audit, which is called a correspondence audit. And it's probably the most common type of audit. So if you get a letter from the IRS saying, hey, here's what you reported on your tax return, here's what our records say, and they're different, that's a correspondence audit. So they might question something really minor and you just have to say, yeah, I agree, or no, I just don't, don't agree, and go from there. An office audit takes place right at the IRS's office. So they will say, hey, we, we have some questions on your tax return, how about you come into our offices? The field audit is the most complex, and it's usually people who will have their own businesses that have this kind of an audit. Um, they'll sit with an IRS agent visiting you at your home, your business, or your accountant's office. So now they're coming to you. That's probably the worst kind to have because now they're in your environment. So, um, you know, you want to make sure everything is correct. What happens? What kind of audit rights? Um, you may have audited, request time to prepare, clarify items being questioned, and know that you have a right to appeal. Um, an audit is kind of like getting a, a speeding ticket from a cop. You know, the cop knows the law, you violated the law, you get a ticket, okay? The IRS knows the law, they think you did something wrong, they give you an audit, they find a finding. Know that you can appeal that finding, go to court, and fight it if you strongly believe and your, your preparer believe you took a proper stance. When audited, decide whether to bring your tax preparer, your accountant, or your lawyer. I say if you have a tax preparer, you always let them know of any type of audit, correspondence, field, or office. Be on time, of course. Present evidence in a logical, calm, and confident manner. Stay positive. Make sure your information follows the tax law and keep your answers aimed at the auditor's questions, just like you would if you were being interviewed in court. Practice tax avoidance. There's legal ways to do this. Legitimate methods to reduce your tax obligation to your fair share, but no more. I mean, people get, bit, you know, sorry. <laughs> people get, you know, chastised for doing this, but it's the law. So you, if you could do it legally, reduce, but still pay your fair share. Financial decisions relating to purchases, investing and retirement are the most heavily affected by tax laws. Tax evasion is when you illegally not pay all the taxes you owe, such as not reporting all your income. If you work under the table, guys, that's tax evasion. Okay, I'm not saying, I, I don't know who does it and who doesn't, but if you don't report that income on your tax return, you are committing tax evasion. So if they find you, you can get in trouble. Minimizing taxes owed. If you expect, here's, here's some rules to follow. If you expect the same or a lower tax rate next year, accelerate deductions into this year because you'll have a greater benefit to a higher rate. If you expect the same tax rate next year, delay income into next year, delay paying taxes till next year. If you expect a higher tax rate next year, try to delay deductions into next year and show income this year when you're at a lower rate. So those are some great strategies to use um, when planning. Now, the final areas of this chapter deal with education deduction or tax credit. So you know there's no such thing as an education deduction anymore. When the book was written, there was, but there still is tax credit for education. So there's no tuition and fees deduction anymore for this $4,000, but there is the American Opportunity Credit, and that is a tax credit, dollar for dollar tax credit. Excuse me one second.
That's a dollar for dollar tax credit um, against your tax liability. Who qualifies for that? The person who claims the dependent for the student. So if the student claims themselves, they would get it. If it's a parent, the parents get it. They can take it, the person who's qualified to take it can take it in the first four years of post-secondary education. So if you're a freshman for five years, it's only the first four years of your freshman year. You must be enrolled at least half time and the credit is up to $2,500. And I can tell you how to calculate it. It's $2,000 dollar for dollar tax credit on the first $2,000 of tuition you, that's non-scholarship or non-grant. So if you have to pay it back or it comes out of right out of your pocket, that qualifies. Now, if the student takes a loan and the parent still claims the student as a dependent, it's like the parent took the loan. Okay, so keep that in mind. So it's dollar for dollar, then it's 25% on the next $2,000. So if you have a student who took a $5,000 loan for school and the parent claims them as a deduction, the first $2,000 of the loan and then 25% of the next $2,000, the parents can take as a American Opportunity Credit, as long as that student is in the first four years and enrolled at least half time. That reduces their tax liability. So if their tax liability that they computed on taxable income is $4,000, they reduce to $2,500. So now they only owe $1,500 in taxes, assuming they didn't pay any money in and all anything else. There's also what's called a lifetime learning credit. So if you're beyond those first four years of post-secondary education, and it could be for part-time um, education, you don't have to be in school at least half time, you can get up to a $2,000 tax credit. Um, one of the best tax shelters, tax savings is owning a home because you can deduct mortgage loan interest and property taxes as an itemized deduction. It's just something to keep in mind. Um, this is not true. Even though you have a home equity loan, you used to be able to take this extra loan out on your home. It's called a second mortgage, if you could, and deduct the interest. You can't do that anymore. You have to use the money for your home. Job-related expenses are no longer deductible as a itemized deduction, okay, but they once were. Healthcare expenses allow you to reduce taxable income when paying for health-related expenses. There's tax-exempt investments, we talked about those. Interest income, usually from certain types of bonds, and these are municipal bonds. So if your local uh, township, county or school district sells bonds and you buy one and you receive interest on them, it's tax-free. You do not have to pay taxes on it. And we talked about retirement plans. Capital gains are gains from, so profits um, from the sale of stocks, bonds, or real estate. If you own these for more than one year, they're considered long-term capital gains. So if you buy something two years ago, and you sell it this year and you have a gain from it, a stock, it's considered a long-term capital gain because you owned it for more than one year. What's important about that is long-term capital gains are taxed at lower rates than you normally pay. So if you're in that 25% bracket, you may only be paying 15% tax on your gain. Self-employment, we talked about those additional taxes and I don't even know why they bring this up, but sometimes your children's investments are taxed special because a lot of times people in higher income brackets try to push some of their money into their children's names and then have earnings on that taxed at their children's lower tax rates than their parents. The government caught on to this in the loophole and they corrected it and said, no, we're not gonna allow that to happen anymore. The children will pay at the parents' rate, basically. That's beyond, I think that's too much for this chapter. 
There's two major types of IRAs. There's what we call the traditional IRA, which was the very first individual retirement account. And it, these were really um, encouraged and brought into the tax code to get people to save for retirement who may not have had a retirement plan at work. So you can normally deduct your contributions as you make them. And then when you take the money out later, um, you pay income tax on it when you retire. A Roth IRA came out in the mid 1990s. And the, a Roth IRA is you make your contributions now, but you don't get a tax deduction for them. But when you, if you leave your money in a Roth IRA investment account for at least five years from the first contribution date, when you take the money out, none of it is taxable. So they're both retirement accounts. It's just the way they are taxed are different. There's other types of um, retirement accounts. Keo plans are for self-employed, so sole proprietors or partners in a partnership. There's the 401k plan that's usually for employees. There, I don't think there's any more Coverdell education savings accounts, but these accounts were savings accounts for people to save or to send their kids to private school. 529 plans, I have one for my son, is where you save money and in a plan. And when you take the money out, it's non-taxable as long as it's used for higher education. Now, before 2018, you had to use it for post-secondary education. As of 2018, you can take money out and have it not taxed up to $10,000 to pay for secondary education. So those like, I guess your primary and secondary education. Okay, there's a lot more than that. Okay, so just, just recent tax changes are showing you. Um, a lot of times uh, the um, congressmen, and remember, just so you know, and I should have told you this to begin with, Congress and the president make tax law, the IRS are the police. So they're the ones who make the tax forms and audit and they make sure people are following the tax law. So when different political parties are in charge or you know, there's different congressmen and um, House of Representatives uh, individuals, they will um, bring up different ways to tax. And one tax that was brought up was a flat tax. So all taxpayers pay that same rate instead of 10, 10 and 15, then 25, okay? Or there's also what's called the value added tax and they actually use this in Europe. They tax a product at each stage in the manufacturing process. So um, they, they put the tax on the manufacturer, but then the manufacturer passes it on to the ultimate consumer when they buy it by charging more for the product. So it's just another way to collect tax. Okay, so that was a lot of stuff. And I know I only plan to spend about a half an hour talking about it, but I went into it a little bit deeper. So tax planning can influence how we spend, how we save, how we borrow and invest. And I um, encourage you to learn a lot about the tax law and to seek professional help. And no, I don't do it. LOL. <laughs> I would say LOL, right? But no, I do not do that anymore um, as I'm not insured or anything. Um, and awareness of income tax, sales tax, excise, property, estate, inheritance, gift, and social security tax. No, it is vital. You need to know what taxes you're going to be paying. We looked at how to calculate taxable income. Remember, we take all of our income that's subject to tax. Not everything is. Remember life insurance proceeds, no. We subtract deductions that are allowed to get to adjusted gross income. Then we subtract the higher of our standard deduction or itemized deductions. Before 2018, we were allowed to deduct exemptions to get to taxable income. We then create our tax liability based on our taxable income, subtract tax credits, add additional taxes we may have to pay, subtract tax payments, ultimately to get you refunds or still amounts owed. Um, we looked at different tax uh, preparation areas. 
and tax strategies, what you want to do. So here's the long descriptions of steps one, two, and three, and you could read through them again. We went through them all. That's the end, okay? So, um, lots of stuff. So please um, post any kind of questions you may have to the discussion board on, you know, preparing the tax, um, determining tax liability. Hopefully it makes a lot more sense to you now.